Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. And we are back with another episode, special episode on education, the importance of education in the Muslim ummah. And we have again with us our respected guest, Michael Abraham from the United States of America. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum How are you, my brother? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, enjoying your summer or what? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, it's been a good summer. It's been a good summer. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So for those of us, for those of our viewers who are just tuning in, maybe it's the first episode they see, they have two to catch up, inshallah. Mm-hmm. So make sure you go back and check out the previous two episodes. And there'll be one special one coming kind of up. Our last, last episode will be about raising men, raising women, raising children. And we're going to have uh, Coach Khadija from Australia joining, inshallah, for an amazing discussion. So that's going to be exciting, inshallah. inshallah. And shall we get uh, Abraham education into uh, the Australian uh, field? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very much needed. Yeah, alhamdulillah. So, Brother Michael, today I would like you to enlighten us on the importance. Let's jump right into it. And this is something, I mean, I, I was a teacher in Canada. I was a teacher in the West and as, as a Muslim male teacher, mm-hmm. I felt that I was needed there. I could tell by the way the children were reacting to me. And I was teaching an inner school, uh, inner city school, mm-hmm. where most of the kids were Muslims. And um, we had a special program, um, and we trained for that, for inner city uh, schools. Yeah. And I felt, I felt my presence not only being respected, but it was needed. Mm-hmm. And however, looking around at my colleagues and other Muslims in our community, it was a heavily female dominated profession. Mm-hmm. Um, not only in Muslim, uh, amongst our community, but you know, throughout. Mm-hmm. And of course, mm-hmm. when you look at the Muslim community, I could count on one hand the amount or the number of brothers who are involved in education. Yes. So what, are, what is your take on that? What's the importance of Muslims, the community, to get into education in general? And specifically, why should men get into education, Muslim men? And you are talking about the public educational uh, yeah. sector. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, first, I mean, first overall, I would say if Muslim males don't get into teaching and I mean, getting a license in the profession and doing it professionally, I would say it's it's going to and it does amount to an abdication of our responsibility towards the young people in general, Mm -hmm. not only the young people in the schools, but in our families as well, because with with nurturing young people with guiding young people, with getting young people to turn out the way you want to, especially in the modern world. And because in, in the modern world, you know, traditionally the Muslim world, I would say, it's relied on collective social pressure to get young people to turn out the way that they want them to. You know, even, and, and this is not going to be true in the 21st century. It's certainly not true in the Western world, obviously, but it's not even going to be true. And maybe it isn't true now in the Muslim world anymore in the 21st century with the media being in everyone's pocket. There's a competition for the minds and the emotions of young and the values of young people. And, and, we're, going, and we're going to have to compete. Now, mm-hmm. as I've said before, kids in the public school system, they spend 16,000 hours of their lives there. So if we don't have a presence in there, we're given the responsibility to someone else. We're expecting someone else to raise our kids, whether we say that or not. That's what our actions are saying it. But there's a skill set that goes along with nurturing kids. And if we don't have those skill sets ourselves, then we don't have them in our homes and in our community spaces either. And and as you said, overall, we don't have a lot of Muslim teachers. Of the ones that that are there, I would say over 90% of them are sisters. You know, of the ones I know, over 90% are sisters. Um, And even the, the males and of the male ones that I do know, even a smaller percentage of them are people who are grown up and raised here in the West. They're, 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 they're more immigrants who, who've come here and transferred their expertise into teaching here. So there's a whole issue of people being able to re- relate to the kids who are growing up 
in the schools and being there, having examples and having models. But there's also an issue of how the skills that go along with managing and motivating and teaching kids transfer into our other spaces. And, you know, to me, the, the reason why this takes place is that there is a general disrespect for the profession uh, amongst Muslims generally, especially when it pertains to males doing it. Because you talk to families about what they want the boys to do, especially you talk to one males about what males, young males about what they want to do. And in my experience this is here in America and in the Muslim world. It's medicine, engineering, tech, maybe accounting. Th those are the fields. Of course, there's nothing wrong with those fields. There's a lot of good in them. But if we, but you know, if we don't prior, if we don't have some priority for teaching, and we want to be panicked and complain about the way the youth are ending up at the same time, then we don't really have a right to do that complaining because we're not doing the work that we actually need to. And mm -hmm. I would say, too, that the, the stigma against males being in teaching amongst Muslims, it's at least here in America, it's based on misconceptions. It's primarily based on mis misconceptions and misperceptions. Right. And subhanAllah, when we look at the Prophet, وسلم, he was called Muallim or teacher. And as you said, that he was sent as a teacher. So you would say in the Arab world, they have a saying that the teacher is in the position of a, or, or an inheritor of the prophets, you know, I mean, that they teach that uh, knowledge. And we know the, the great legacy of education within Islam. So it's quite uh, paradoxical to see that Muslims don't respect the teaching profession, right? But I would like you to uh, comment a little bit more. You've said something interesting. You're talking about people coming from the Muslim world and transferring their qualifications and then being as teacher. Would you be able to elaborate a bit more as to why or what, what would be the, the solution to that if someone comes from the, you know, from a Muslim country, for example, and wants to be a teacher, what's missing there? What, what were you talking about? Well, I mean, the there's different ways to become licensed as a teacher in the United States. You know, now if you if you have a degree in some field already, that will complement you getting a te teaching license usually, especially mm -hmm. in secondary school, because you're going to get licensed in a specific area. So if right. you have a degree in science or, or, or history, or or, or or maths or something like this, you know, you already will have, have some credits built up that that you would need to get anyway to get a teaching license. So you're going to be part of the way there already. And if you have a bachelor's degree, usually the process of getting a postgraduate teaching license is shorter than getting an undergraduate te teaching license. So the teacher, the people I'm referring to, they're usually people who studied like engineering or something like this, mm -hmm. or, may, or maybe history. They might have gotten their degree in Sudan or Turkey or Pakistan. I know, I know people, people like this. And then they were okay. able to do, then they were able to do a few courses when they came here. Actually, usually a lot of times they came here for a different reason. But, and then they ended up switching into teaching. And that's one of the misperceptions about teaching. Teaching is a profession that people go in and out of all the time. Right. And becoming a teacher when you're younger doesn't prevent you from doing something later. And if you've done something already, that doesn't prevent you from becoming a teacher uh, already, you know, both practically and economically as well. Hmm. But what's the cultural element that might be missing from people coming from the east to the west because you said there's there's a lack of connection maybe between the the teacher and the student that's that's an important element isn't it for that mm -hmm. teacher to connect to the students for the the transfer of knowledge but as well as for the the, well, the tarbiya <clears throat> well i mean there's nothing wrong with someone coming here and being a teacher but there's just practical things to, practical things where if you did not grow up here you know the the the, the kids growing up here they, they, you know, it's not that they can't like them and disrespect them, but you don't know the experience of growing up here. And, and, it, and it is a, it is a unique experience grow, growing up here versus growing up in the Muslim world. So, I mean, so that's just a reality, you know, in schools, you spend the most time working with the kids who struggle the most and the kids who are the least motivated. So, right. this, so the issue of motivation in education is really big and kids who are struggling and we have a lot of Muslim kids who are struggling in their school and just generally males are struggling in education disproportionate to females. And statistically, it's known in the United States that that phenomenon is exacerbated with students of color 
And it's and it is 100 percent seen in our Muslim student populations as well. I think I said last time about how in my trainings I would collect uh, questions from teachers. They'd fill out an intake form before coming to my training that was anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I, an I gathered hundreds of questions from teachers over time and I analyzed them and categorized them each one. I found from that the most frequently occurring question that teachers had was about the disengagement of boys or the misbehavior of boys in school. Over 10% of the questions that I got from teachers were about that specific thing. Looking, in, looking into research that I have cataloged in my book uh, uh, about Muslims experience in education in the Western world in general, North America and Europe and Australia, the same phenomenon goes on throughout the Western world of Muslim boys being disengaged in education. Of course, not all, but, but, but a predictable sum, regardless of the ethnic background from them and regardless of the Western country that they're in. And the Muslim boys, when they're disengaged in education or they have behavior problems, it's more likely that the teacher is going to cast upon them that it is for some sort of cultural religion reason or some sort of religious reason. So. You know, we need people in these spaces to help others and just to, to help motivate the kids and help cross these bridges, just as far as being in the public education system. And then, you know, the compound benefit from that is we have more people in our community learning the skills of developing authentic motivation in kids because mm. we can't rely on coercing kids into following Islam and turning out the way that we want to anymore. So we, we have another problem in our in, 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 the, the, in, the, in the masjids and in our homes where there's not enough males who know how to execute these skills with the kids. And if, if that's missing, it's not gonna be good overall. And you know, if, you know, if males are not good at something, a lot of times they tend to withdraw from it and want to, and want to avoid it. And, mm -hmm. then, you know, we, and then we gender separate in our socialization, which most people do of course anyway, but you know, without enough Muslim teachers just being around, there's not enough people to transfer these skills of how you, of how you raise kids, how you, how you nurture kids, how you talk to kids in a way that they will listen to, to spread in our community. Mm. It's interesting, when I, when I went to teacher's college, um, even though I know the research that you're talking about, the disengagement of, of males, specifically boys, when it comes to education, but it, it doesn't seem like people bring that research into the light. They don't, they don't train you with that in mind. Is there a reason for that? Like, what, what do you see? Why don't we hear about this? Why don't we, why don't we go into the classroom, prepare teachers to go with that mindset that I need to pay attention to this, this group? Well, I mean, yeah, there's reasons for it. I mean, there's, th there is things working against that and there's people working against that. But again, mm -hmm. the solution to that problem is for us to be in these places so we can bring it in. Because ultimately mm -hmm. what goes on in schools is the sum of the people in it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, I, I mean, I do meet people who don't understand, who've gone through teacher training and they don't understand that research exists, you know, mm -hmm. but they will see the phenomenon play out in their school. I mean, almost any school right. in America right now, Indeed. If, you, if, you, if you analyze the honor roll of the school, it's going to be 60% female, 40% males. And again, the gap is going to be even further in schools where the population is primarily students of color. You know, if you look at them, it's not a practice I agree with differentiating kids by reading level that they do in elementary school a lot, but it's a common practice in American schools, a poor one in my opinion. Right. But, you know, if you take a fourth grade, fifth grade class where they have the kids in a class uh, grouped by different lit reading levels. Reading levels, yeah. the, the highest level, you have five or six students in the highest level in each group going down. I guarantee you there's not going to be more than one male in that highest reading level. Now, part of that has to do with the, the different developmental trajectories of males and females, and, and there's different things about it. But right. I mean, but teachers who are actually practicing, they, they see the phenomenon play out very clearly uh, in front of them. So they're, they're, they're responsive to the research if you show it to them. And I've told people before, you know, so it, overall the teaching population in America is 75% female. In elementary school, it's about 90%. Mm -hmm. My experience overwhelmingly, both working in elementary school and consulting with all these teachers, is the, the, the females in these elementary schools, they know that they need male teachers. And especially as America continues to go through these demographic changes, where the, where the teachers are culturally and demographically different from the student populations that they're, that they're teaching, mm -hmm. it, like the, the need to have male teachers in there only grows within them even more. 
And especially if they have a high amount of Muslim kids in that population, I mean, these teachers, these, these schools would be quick to hire a, a Muslim male who, who applies for the job just, just because of their familiarity with, with the community. And, and, and schools too here in America, they, they love to hire people who have experience with youth in cultural spaces. Mm-hmm. So, so just, just having done some volunteering at a masjid or something like that, or, you know, even having just visited a youth program or just having a lot of family members who, who, right. who, are, who come from this community, that is something that you can leverage to, to, to get a job. And I'm sorry, I'm talking too long. But, you, you know, too, we have an issue right now in America, and I'm sure it's throughout Muslims in the Western world. We have a lot of young adult males who are kind of lost. A lot of times their being lost is built on a poor schooling experience in the first place. They weren't as they weren't successful in school as their families were hoping they would be. Then they got into you know college. Maybe they couldn't be successful there, or they couldn't get into the program that the family wanted them to, or that they were expecting themselves. Because there, a lot of times, it's almost always the case to get into teaching school. It's not as academically demanding as getting into engineering or medicine or even tech. So a lot of these young right. males in, in our community who aren't quite sure what to do with themselves, they should go into teaching. They should go into teaching. And one of the misconceptions that people have about teaching is they think I didn't like school, so I wouldn't like teaching. That, that, that is totally wrong thinking because it's actually a problem in the education system that most people who do go into teaching are people who liked teaching themselves or, or they liked school themselves. So they calculate in their own minds, well, I like school growing up. Why don't I be a teacher and just be in school all the time? But the problem with that is that teacher who liked school, they were a self-motivated student and they were a good student, but those aren't the students who you spend most of your time tending to in a school because they're not the students who cause the issues. Sure. So, these te- so these teachers, they don't know how to motivate and how to connect with the kids who are struggling. But someone mm-hmm. who had that same experience, who didn't like their K through 12 schooling, they become a valuable asset inside a school because they can actually connect with those kids and motivate them. Okay, so mashallah, we have the, the problem is quite clear that there is a lack of male teachers, specifically Muslim male teachers in inner city schools where there's predominantly Muslim population, such as Minneapolis and others. What is the solution? What can the Muslim community do? And where does your work and your book come in to play in this issue? How do we solve this problem? How do you, how do you see it? Well, I mean, you know, as far as what the Muslim can do, the Muslim community can do is just start valuing education for the boys more and the idea of them going into teaching. And again, I, I, I'm telling you, I mean, myself, I was not a good student growing up, you know. So, so, so I'm speaking partly from my personal experience here. A lot of these young males that we have in the community who maybe they're in their 20s, maybe even in their 30s, and they're, you know, not sure what to do we should put the idea in their heads to try to go into teaching because it's a field you can go into at any time. Mm -hmm. It's a field that a lot, again, a lot of people transition in and out of it from other careers. So the teaching schools make the programs very, very flexible to be done. A lot of it can be done online. There's night classes, day classes, can be done slowly over time, all this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So just valuing boys doing it. Because both when I talk to young males and parents, you know, everyone has anxiety about how the youth is turning out, but no one is thinking about this as a solution and understanding the compound benefits of it. Because the more that we develop these skills within the male population of the Muslim community, the more the skills are going to transfer to the communal and social spaces that we have. And they're just absolutely needed in there right now. You know, and, and to people, they need to look into more about how much teachers actually make, because a lot of this resistance for the males to want to go into teaching is because they don't think they're going to make enough money for it and they want to be providers as they should be and all the and all this stuff but a lot of that is based on misperception at least in america it depends where you are um you know the 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 northern states usually pay a little better than the southern states here in the united states might depend on the district some too you know and the first couple years of getting into teaching when you get into the job are usually hard you know because you're learning how to do it but it's a big it's it's a big trial you know, and, and, you know, people will talk about how, how building, you know, part of building into manhood is putting yourself through challenges. I mean, if you want to challenge, right. try getting in a room with 25 
young people <laughs> keeping their attention and motivating them for an hour and then do Hello. it five times a day 180 days out of the year <laughs> believe me you're, you're going to get challenged and you're going to learn things about yourself that, that you never knew before but you'll no, no. get important you'll get important skills out of it and it's it's true that ha half half the people who go into teaching they do quit in the first two years because right. it is hard but you know you know if but but at the same time, in teaching, there's a direct, at least in America, there's a there's going to be a direct relationship between the years of experience that you have teaching, and the amount of education you have to give yourself a predictable income, and the income is usually more than people think, because there's a political incentive of the teachers unions in America to keep the narrative going that teachers aren't paid well, because that always, because as long as that narrative is set, then the the motivation of politicians to vote for more funds for teachers to be paid is said as well here in the state of minnesota but if you know part of that too if you look at teacher salaries on an hourly basis you find that they compare well with other fields just take minnesota as an example if you look at the average teacher salary in minnesota and you compare it to the average salary of a mechanical engineer in minnesota yes the annual salary will be more for the mechanical engineer but right. if you break it down on an hourly basis, hourly basis, it's actually more for the average teacher. teacher. Well, why is that? It's because as a teacher, you get 25% of the year off because you get yeah. two and a half to three months off in the summer. And then you're going to get another three or four weeks off in during the school year. In addition to the, the, the two weeks sick time that you can take off as well. That time creates all sorts of flexibility for you flexibility that you can use to invest in other things. You can build other projects. You can invest it in the community, invest it in your family. And, and um, you know, there was a, there was a financial consultant in the state of Tennessee. His name is Dave mm -hmm. Ramsey. He's written some books. He did a, the largest survey ever done of millionaires in America. He surveyed over 10,000 millionaires in America. He found the top three professions amongst the millionaires in America. Number one is engineer. Number two is accountant. Number three is teacher. Now, none of those three professions generally pay someone a seven-figure salary, but they're all professions that taught people skills and or gave them time and flexibility, in the case of teaching, to start projects where they could invest money and learn how to make it grow. And, and it happens all the time that teachers parlay the skills they learn in teaching into starting a business or into doing other things. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Uh, would you say that is the community doing enough to to raise awareness of this, the importance of uh, males and just Muslims getting into teaching? Like, should we have more khutbahs, special programs at the masjid? Are you doing anything to raise awareness in the community? I mean, all I do is talk to people about what I can and people I talk to, you know, I, I've, I've helped. You know, you know, one th something I've done here is I I've helped a masjid here, like, like teach them some skills with their weekend school to work on better managing the kids and, and better motivating this type of thing. And, you know, they, they saw some of the huge benefits of that, you know, you know, so, so, so that type of thing. I mean, I mean, there's not much more I can do than talk about people, but yes, I, just, I think it needs to be made a priority. You know, I think it needs to, be, be, needs to be made a priority, you know, and maybe some analysis of why it hasn't been a priority so far and some, you know, admission that it was a mis it's a mistake and it's cost us in the way kids have turned out. But, you know, changing that, changing that attitude, you know, over a generation, it can have a lot of compound benefits. It can, and as I said before, to some of our young people and young males who are struggling right now and a little lost, it can be a solution for them. Mm -hmm. I remember in uh, Windsor, there was a uh, cooperation between our local university, the teacher, mm -hmm. teacher's college there, with the Islamic schools in the community. So you could actually do your practicum in the Muslim schools if you want to. Uh, do you guys have that kind of uh, arrangement or? No, not that I know of. I don't think we would have that in the state of Minnesota at least. However, something I will say, I mean, something that is sometimes a barrier for people getting into teaching is the fact that you will have to do either eight to 16 weeks of student teaching usually. And a lot of times, you know, if you don't have the money to take that time off work and you're working a job, that's a bit of a barrier. There can be practical practical barriers to it. However, during COVID last year, people actually did that online, which is something I didn't ever think I'd ever see. Right. You know, so again, like, you know, the 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 need of teacher colleges, they the need for them to be flexible is something they've known for a long time, and they they've been developing that way. 
So, so there really is all kinds of opportunities to get into it. You know, there is a, it depends on the state in America, but certainly the case in Minnesota, there's lots of opportunities to get a job teaching before you are fully licensed. Me, I did that because I started teaching in Saudi before I had a teaching license. I had a degree in political science. When I moved back, I got a full-time teaching job on a temporary license with a school that let that supported me for three years while I did my teaching license. So, and that's another thing too, brothers who are working overseas and I understand some of them, they made hijra and they're working in the Khalid or wherever, you know, I'm not trying to encourage anyone to come back home if that's not what they want to do, but there's a lot of brothers who they go do the teaching English thing and they find that, you know, after a few years, it doesn't really work for them or their family to stay there. They should understand too, when you come back, and this is also too with people born and raised in the Muslim world who did teaching there. The culture now has changed enough in education that the, your years experience in another country, they will count that towards your, towards your experience and your salary scale. So like, like my three years, you know, like when you, in a teacher contract, it has a direct grid scale where you have the years of experience going down and your education going, your education credits going out the other. And the more of both you have, the more money you make. So my three years working in Saudi, those count on my teacher scale. And, I, and I've never had an issue with that. So it's another thing people in other countries too, if they come to the West, at least come to America to so understand that that type of experience. Or if you're a young brother who is, you know, finishing college and you want to go to the Muslim world for a while, do the teaching English thing or, or something like this, you should understand that you can parlay that into coming back and into a job. It, it's very, very possible. And even the experience working in a foreign country is something they value, especially if it was a Muslim country and it's a school with a lot of Muslim kids. There's lots of those schools now. Mashallah, mashallah. There, there are a lot of uh, brothers and sisters who do make, as you said, the hijra with the Muslim world. And they, it, I mean, teaching was, is not their profession, but they do, a, a, you know, CELTA, DELTA, different qualifications. And then it's, I think their, their objective is to just kind of get their foot into the Muslim country because it's quite an easy way to do it when you're a teacher, right? They love uh, Western teachers or Western qualified teachers. Mm -hmm. And then um, they find that that might be a profession that they want to, uh, to pursue later on. And a lot of people do remain as teachers in the Muslim countries for 10, 15, 20 years, and they make great money. So that's also an, <clears throat> an option. And Allah knows that we, we need a lot of uh, good Muslim teachers in the Muslim countries as well, not only Absolutely. Uh, in the US. It's a really, really, I mean, when I went to the Khalij, I would like to say that it was, I was just looking today at some pictures. I posted a couple on, on Instagram of my old classroom, you know, my students. And I was really, I was being nostalgic and I was just, I was missing those times. And it was just a, such a great experience. And as you said, like I moved on into management and, you know, uh, becoming a school principal. But I think putting aside my, you know, years studying psychology, I think, being a teacher was the best experience for me and just in terms of life skills, just in, even in terms of like management, even in terms of management, like mm -hmm. what I've learned, as you said, oh, managing 25 you kids. You learn how, how to manage people. You learn how to put people in systems. You learn how to, you know, the thing is too, the fundamentals of a lot of those things, they're, they're, they're the same for, for kids, teenagers, and, and, and adults, the fundamentals of them. So when you can learn how to teach a kid something, you can learn how to get a kid to perform a new task. You can you learn how to put a group of kids into a system. Doing it with adults or, or older people, it's only going to be easier from there. Right. You know, one thing I'd like to follow up, number one, just talking about teaching the Muslim world. I'd like to give a shout out to my students in Saudi, a lot of whom I've been able to reconnect with recently since I got on Instagram. Mashallah, they're in college. You know, and that's one of the joys of teaching. Like you get Beautiful. to watch people grow. And, and unlike most, you know, adults, they are much harder to change than young people. You know, one of the beautiful yeah. things about working with young people is you, you can actually see them change, which is very inspiring and gives you hope. You know, you asked about the place of my work with my book and my training course in yeah. all of this. You know, one of the misconceptions that people have sometimes about teaching is that, the, especially with public education here in America, is that the public education institutes are left-wing indoctrination factories. Now, you know, there, there's activist groups and there's, there's you know, there, there's activist groups and people with that. But it's really a different story on the ground level. And as I've talked about in the previous videos, teachers right. in America have a lot of autonomy. Now, there is going to be this cultural clash and things like being in a male working in a building that's 90 percent women being a Muslim male. Yes. Yes, there's issues with that. So there. So, you know, there is an educational project to be done 
of the non-Muslim educators themselves. But my book and my train have put that together to shortcut the process to, for people and to formalize it. So, you know, being in these places and giving the book to people or, or recommending the training course, this type of thing, you know, that can be something to, that can shortcut some of the concerns that someone might have of being a Muslim male and going into those spaces and also have the greater benefit of educating people about our needs as a Muslim community and about Islam in general. MashaAllah. Can we look forward to seeing a, a book or a training course in the future about uh, uh, maybe uh, geared towards the Muslim community and getting more involved into education or uh, what do you think, or you stick into what you're doing? Well, I won't put a course together for that. I'm just going to, I'm just starting to talk about this stuff on my Instagram right. page. I'll put more on my YouTube channel, this type of stuff. I mean, this type of stuff concerning the Muslims, I'm just, I'm not going to put a course together for it. I'm just going to be talking about it on my pages and this type of thing. Cause I want this information to be out here, you know, at no cost. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So as for those look, again, too, just another thing too, you know, on my Instagram page, I talk about things in terms of parenting as well. And this is a really big thing that you have to understand because, because the skills of teaching, they absolutely transfer to parenting. Transfer I'm sure you've experienced that in your life, 100%. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and look, you know, people have to understand, as I was saying before, parenting and teaching, they are something that you, 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 you tend to fail in if you just wing it. You know? And I'm not, I'm not encouraging anyone to wait to do these things because I'm not, I'm not a big fan of that. But mm -hmm. you, know, you need knowledge and skills and intentional action to nurture kids well just like anything else that, that comes from with learning and practice. So if you go into teaching, you actually get that learning and practice with lots of kids all the time. And then raising your own kids it becomes something that you get very good at and you don't have so much anxiety about. And, you know, again, if, you know, we don't have enough, you know, when I, when I talk with brothers, they're very eager to learn about the things I know as a teacher. And, and, and it's like, it's like they're hungry for someone to talk to about this because we don't have enough brothers who are just around talking about the needs of kids, about the different needs of the different developmental stages, the different ways to talk to them, the sequence in the way you talk to them, the mannerisms that you have when you talk to them. You know, all, the, all this stuff is things that, that there's, there's somewhat of a science and an art to that you need knowledge in to execute properly. And we just simply need the skills in the community. You know, I, I, hope, I hope you don't mind if I talk constantly about something but, you know, in the weekend schools, most of what our ki kids do is they are memorizing the Quran. Right. Now, we've had all these kids who've grown up here now, they're adults, they had such a negative experience with that because it was boring. You know, they, they felt they were shamed too much in there and, and, and they didn't like it. So they have completely negative associations with it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, too, a big thing that kids actively complain to me about is they learn to memorize the Quran in there, but they don't learn what it means. What and means they don't that? actually learn about the religion. Now, people recognize that we should teach the kids the tenets of the religion and the values really even before they start memorizing the Quran because the Quran will mean more to them when they know those things. Right. But part of the reason why there's so much memorizing done in the Masajid is because the memorizing of the Arabic and the Quran, it keeps the kids really busy. So right. it's a way to keep them occupied. And that takes care of the management piece a lot. And the right. reality is, and I'm not trying to blame the brothers who are doing this work in the masjid, because a lot of them are sacrificing their time and their energy, and they're working as hard as they can. Mm -hmm. But there's not enough skill in there to actually get the kids to sit and listen when it's 25 of them and one adult. You know, they'll right. sit quietly in the masjid when there's 35 adults and just a handful of kids listening to a, an adult lecture because the adults are going to give them a stern look if they act up or something. Although more and more, the kids are just, I'm seeing the kids just be given the phones during that time, which is a whole nother good, good that, that's not a good thing either. But we right. don't have enough people who actually know the skills. I mean, there is very practical, detailed skills to talking to a group of kids in a way where they will actually sit and listen and intake what you're saying. So, so, so people in the Masajid, when, it's, when, when the kid to adult ratio is weighted on the side of the kids, there is genuinely a fear of making the kids sit and listen because people practically don't know how to do it. And you'll start talking. They won't understand what you're saying. So the kids will start talking to one another. They'll start, you know, they'll, they'll start poking at one another and misbehaving. And then, you know, you feel like, you know, the teacher feels like they got to yell at them. And then this whole downward cycle, you, you know, goes into that no one wants to get into. So again, there's, you know, and, and, and again, me, obviously in the masjid, I've seen this all on the brother's side, 
this is all on the brother's side that I'm talking about. I've seen this, you know, I really, I don't know what's going on, on the sister's side. This is all on the brother's side. You know, the, right. the, these, are, these are actual, you know, this is something we need to reconcile that we need these skills and we don't have them. And the solution is getting more young Muslim males into teaching and valuing that for males more. Yeah, the training is very important. Yes, I agree. More young men, Muslim men to get into teaching. M maybe even imams as they are teachers to uh, go through some training, mashallah, to understand how to connect to the students. We're not saying that memorization is not important. We're saying it's very important, but it's not the only thing. And if it's done only or exclusively, just rote memorization is, is not enough. The Prophet ﷺ, you know, compared it and connected it to Bani Israel and how they just memorized and they, they did not benefit from, from what was being said. And we know that was just not his practice. It's not prophetic education to just memorize. And it is a problem because you're not understanding what you are learning and you're not connecting, you're not internalizing it. Hence, you cannot, there's no outcome. There's, there's no outcome. And education has outcomes. You know, the, it, the, 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 the outcome is the kids have negative associations with their Islamic learning. Exactly. Mm. SubhanAllah. What can uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, we've talked in each episode a little bit, give us, uh, how can we connect to you? What can we do? What can Muslim parents do to help themselves, to help their own children by connecting to your course? Talk to, talk to us a little bit about your course and what you're doing. We'll get my course. It's called Engaging Muslim Students in Public Schools. You know, we'll have links in the description, I'm sure, to look more yeah. into it. You know, my website is abrahameducation.com. You can read the testimonials of what the non-Muslim educators have said about it on there and, and, and how it's affected them and given them insights and tools to better engage Muslim students. You can, you can get the book on Amazon and, you know, I, I, you can look up Abraham Education on YouTube. I'm going to have more videos posting there. I'm posting sure. daily during the summer, at least, on, on Instagram. Abraham underscore education on Instagram. So, you know, you can just follow me. I mean, on the Instagram page, I'm trying to just talk, you know, pri primarily to the Muslims, though I actually have a lot of non-Muslim teachers who've done my training on there as well, um, you know, about, about the, the soft skills that you need to, to, to properly interact with kids, you know, and, and young people and, and teenagers, especially, but really a lot of it's the same for younger kids and teenagers, you know, so, so, so there's ways to follow me. You know, and, and, a lot, and as I've been on these things, more and more people have been reaching out. So, you know, people can can reach out to me, message me on there with questions, this type of thing. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to keep doing that stuff, um, you know. And, and, you know, maybe something I'll talk about on my channels or we can talk about in the future is some practical things the, the massages should do as well and consider. Let, 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 right. let, 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 that's something that's, you know, because I have done that with the masjid here with a lot of success. And, um, you know, those, those are some practical things that, that we can talk about and do. Yeah, very important. I think the work that you're doing is, is fundamental for, for Muslim parents. As you said, uh, the skills, the soft skills that you're uh, getting from teaching can, it can be extended to parenting and, you know, dealing with parents on a regular basis as a school principal. We know that that's one of the main concern of, of parents. How, how does my... How does your teacher connect to my child? How does he, how does he, um, how does he differentiate? My child learns this way. My child has this difficulty. Or what? What do you do as a school? And what do you do as a teacher to to make sure that my child learns, not just listens and just is present in class, but actually learns? And it's it's great that at least the Muslim community can reach out uh, to experts in the field which we don't have too many. We can count them, you know, on our hands. And, and look, I want to say something else too. You know, the course, it's something that people outside America can recommend to, yes. to teachers as well. You know, even in the Muslim world where you have non-Muslim teachers working in a teacher, please, please recommend it to them. You know, and, and I ask people too, especially the people who've, who've watched these three podcasts that we've done, you know, please try to take this as a call to action. You know, we, we have non we have the same discourse always going on in the Muslim right. community. You know, you know, like we can consume media forever and, and there's a need to have presence in media and all that type of stuff. But but, you know, me, I really want people to understand there is actions that we can take and making people more aware of these educational materials that I've created it is a big action step that over the course of time, it can help mend some of the problems that we have. 
trying to encourage young males to get into teaching and, and, and nurturing those skills, developing those skills in our community. It is action items that we can take that can mend the issues that everyone is concerned about over the course of time. Inshallah, bid Inshallah. We're going to try to uh, tag a few of these organizations in the Muslim world that I've worked for because as you've said just uh, reminding myself of an experience that I had before I mean I really wish that my colleagues would have had your course you know because there was a whole influx of non-Muslim teachers into the Muslim world about uh, about 13 years ago it was a huge education reform and you know, I remember the, the turnover rate was so big because there was no the, the compatibility, the cultural compatibility. They didn't know. They just think they thought I'm coming from New York State and I'm going to teach exactly the same way, you know, and it just didn't work. And people were, you know, they're just going back home, you know, over the weekend, over the holidays and not coming back because they just couldn't connect to to them. I, I think if they would have taken your course and understand those Muslim students and their culture and how to reach, how to engage them. That's the key word, right? That we're using here, engaging Muslim students. I think the, the system would have been more successful because I know that the company spent um, hundreds of millions uh, of, of, of dirhams on, on this project and they didn't get the, 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 what they wanted to. <laughs> so subhanAllah. Not the, it's not the first time I've heard that story either. Yeah, subhanAllah. Uh, brother Michael Abraham, Barakallah Fik, inshallah, check out the links, guys, in the description. Make sure you follow him on YouTube, Instagram, all the social media we're going to provide for you. If you want to reach out to him, you have questions and so on, and check out, purchase his book on Amazon to support the work. The more we get him to work on these uh, projects to be more free, inshallah, the more we can benefit from his experience, the more you parents, Muslim parents, can benefit and your children can benefit, inshallah. Barakallah fikum, brother Michael, inshallah, we'll see you ta'ala next time. We got uh, Coach Khadija coming on. It's going to be a great discussion. I'm excited to uh, connect to the land down under, inshallah, <laughs> and to, uh, to get into the Aussie uh, community. Mashallah, we have a lot of Muslims in Australia. I had the, ben, the, the blessings to visit them. Great community, very tight, mashallah. A lot of great projects, and I think there that's that will be the missing piece for you to connect inshallah bin ilai ta'ala inshallah barakallah fiq wa jazakumullah khair see you guys next time assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam